Number 5. Jane Doe 193 UFNY On December 6, 1983, a woman's body was found in a ditch near Ellery, New York. She had been shot four times, once in the mouth, once in the back, and twice in the chest. The woman was wearing an expensive, high-quality red trench coat that only had European sizing on the tag. When the police searched the body, they found that the woman had no identification. What they did find was a note that was written on stationery from the Blue Boy Motor Hotel, which was a seedy hotel that was located 2,400 miles away in Vancouver, British Columbia. The note, which is on the screen now, contains several initials, abbreviations, and numbers. The police are unsure if the note is connected to the murder, but it is one of the few pieces of evidence that they do have in the case. They also have DNA from the victim, who is called Jane Doe 193 UFNY. Her DNA and her fingerprints were added to the FBI's CODIS DNA database and the U.S. Justice Department's Name Us database. Unfortunately, neither her DNA nor her fingerprints were a match to any missing persons in the two systems. The police believe that the woman most likely lived in Canada or Europe at least for an extended period of time because she was using an IUD birth control device that was manufactured in Europe but only sold in Canada and Europe and not in the United States. It also appears that she had dental work done in Europe as well. Other than that, not much is known about Jane Doe 193 UFNY, let alone who shot her four times and left her body in a ditch to rot. Number 4. The Circleville Rider Circleville, Ohio is a small city about an hour's drive from Columbus and it is home to a series of disturbing crimes. Starting in 1976, several of the town's 12,000 residents started receiving letters written in distinctive block letters. All of the letters were unsettling because they included personal details about the recipients. Many of the letters also accused the recipient of doing something illegal or immoral. Most of the letters closed with threats and at times they were directed at the recipient's children. One person who seemed to get the brunt of the writer's attention was school bus driver Mary Gillespie. She was the first known person to get a letter and it accused her of having an affair with the superintendent of the schools. She was told to end the affair or there would be dire consequences. The writer also said that he or she was watching the house and they knew about Mary's children. At first, Mary ignored the letter, thinking it was just a disturbing prank, but then two more letters came. After her husband Ron received a letter from the mysterious writer, she came forth with her letters. She said that she wasn't having an affair and she had no idea who the writer was. Ron and Mary discussed the letters with some family members and they thought they figured out who was sending them. They wrote a letter of their own telling the person to stop it. And for a while, the letters did stop. But that is when the case took a tragic turn. On the night of August 19th, 1977, Ron Gillespie got a phone call. Apparently, the caller gave the identity of the writer. Ron hung up the phone, grabbed his handgun, and drove off in his pickup truck to confront the writer without telling anyone who he was. Unfortunately, Ron was killed on the way to the confrontation after his car slammed into a tree. An autopsy was performed and the coroner found Ron's blood alcohol level to be twice the legal limit. One oddity about the crash that the police did note was that Ron's gun had fired one bullet. After the crash, the police began to look into the letters. The police interviewed the man that Ron and Mary wrote the letter to, but they ruled him out as a suspect. Since Ron didn't say who he was going to confront, it's unclear if he was going to confront the man that they sent the letter to, or if he was going to confront the real writer. Despite the fact that the man lost his life and the police were now investigating the letters, they didn't stop. In the 1980s, politicians and residents of Circleville were flooded with thousands of threatening letters written in distinctive block letters. However, the writer hadn't forgotten about Mary Gillespie. After her husband's death, Mary announced that she was in a relationship with the school superintendent that the writer accused her of having the affair with. Mary claimed that the relationship only started after she became a widow. In 1983, Mary was driving her school bus route, which included a country road, and that was when she saw some big signs posted along the side of the road threatening her. When Mary saw one that threatened her daughter, she stopped the bus and tore the sign down. After doing so, Mary discovered that the sign had a string tied to it. She followed the string and the other end went into a box that was attached to a pole. She tore open the box and inside was a small pistol. The police were called and they concluded that it was a trap. The gun was supposed to shoot Mary once she pulled the sign down. The gun's serial number had been filed off, but the police were able to trace it back to a man named Paul Freshhour, who was married to Ron Gillespie's sister, making him Mary's brother-in-law. He was brought in for questioning and he told the police that his gun had been stolen months before. He also denied being the writer and he voluntarily did a handwriting analysis test. The police concluded that Freshhour's handwriting was similar so he was charged with attempted murder. He was found guilty and he was sentenced to 7 to 25 years in prison. 
However, the letters didn't stop with Fresh Hour in prison. They were still being mailed out at an alarming rate to the residents of Circleville. In an effort to stop the letters, Fresh Hour was put into solitary confinement and his mail was monitored. Even this didn't stop the letters which were being mailed out from Columbus and Paul was in prison 90 miles away in Lima. Fresh Hour sat in prison, sometimes in solitary confinement, for seven years and then he was finally able to apply for parole. However, he was denied because people were still getting threatening letters with the distinctive block letters. After his parole was denied, Fresh Hour got a letter himself which read, Now when are you going to believe you aren't going to get out of there? I told you two years ago, when we set them up, they stay set up. Don't you listen at all? In total, Fresh Hour spent 10 years in prison. The letters continued on into the 1990s when they finally came to an end as mysteriously as they started. Paul Freshhire always denied that he was the Circleville Redder and he died on June 28, 2012. Number 3. Wayne Gravett On December 12, 1996, 42-year-old Wayne Gravett found a package in his mailbox that was delivered by Canada Post. He carried the package, which looked like a Christmas present, into his house in rural Moffat, Ontario. Inside the box, there was a letter written on a typewriter, some crumpled up flyers, and a flashlight. When Gravett flicked on the flashlight, it exploded, and he was killed instantly in front of his wife and 21-year-old son. The police were called, and they concluded that someone had made a bomb and disguised it as a flashlight. One major clue in the murder of Gravette was the note that was found in the box. It was written on a Smith Corona typewriter, model 10-12, number 59543. It was addressed to Gravette and it was a business proposal. The writer said that they were planning on opening a new business called Acton Home Products and they wanted a quote from Gravette. They also said that they had worked with Gravette in the past. In the last paragraph, the writer says that he plans to open the business in the new year and is excited to hear from Gravette. The letter writer signs off as William J. French and there is an address in Acton, Ontario which is a community about 20 minutes away from Gravette's farm. Finally, and most hauntingly, the postscript of the letter says, Have a very Merry Christmas, and may you never have to buy another flashlight. The police are completely baffled as to why Gravette was targeted, and who was responsible for his brutal murder. Number 2. The Tainong North Serial Killer Originally, the police thought that the first victim of the Tainong North serial killer was 74-year-old Bertha Miller, who vanished on her way to church on August 20, 1980. She was supposed to walk to a tram stop, which was about 1,300 feet away from her house in Glen Iris, Victoria, Australia. Then, 18 days later on the morning of March 28, 1980, 14-year-old Catherine Headland went to catch a bus to go to her part-time job. When she didn't show up to work, the police were notified. Searches were launched, but Catherine could not be found. In October 1980, 18-year-old Anne Marie Sargent was kidnapped when she went to catch public transportation. Then, in November 1980, 34-year-old Narumal Stevenson from Northkit disappeared without a trace. The disappearance of the four women would stay a mystery until December 6, 1980. That's when the police were called to bushland in Tainong North. A man dumping an animal carcass came across the decomposing bodies of three women. They were identified as Bertha Miller, Catherine Headland, and Anne Marie Sargent. Catherine and Anne Marie were both nude, but Bertha was fully clothed. A couple of months later, the body of Narumal Stevenson was found about a mile away from where the other three women were dumped. Like Catherine and Anne Marie, she was nude. Since there was so much decomposition, the police are unsure how the women died, but they are pretty sure that all the murders were committed by the same individual or the same group of people. They also believe that the same person or persons were responsible for two other abduction murders in Frankston, another suburb of Victoria. 59-year-old Alison Rook was kidnapped near her home on May 30th, 1980, which would make her the killer's first victim. Then, on October 9th, 1981, Caramel Summers, 55, also went missing from Frankston. Both women went missing while waiting for public transportation, and both of their bodies were found a short distance away in bushland in Frankston North, about 25 miles from where the other four bodies were found in Tainong North. Eight years took by and the police still had no idea who the killer was. They had several suspects, but no arrests were made. That's when Catherine Headland's mother received a disturbing handwritten anonymous Christmas card with terrible grammar and spelling that reads, I hope in writing to you I do not cause you or your family any stress. I can comprehend the pain, the agony you have to endure to lose a loved one, Catherine, not knowing when or if the perpetrators will ever be caught. Well, the new year may be good for you. Things may unfold. The name of the perpetrator, whose deeds make Tarot look like kid stuff. P.S. I'll keep in touch. Sometime in the new year. A non-friend. Tarot is a reference to an infamous series of seven murders committed over two months in 1976 and 1977 by Christopher Robin Worrell and James William Miller in Tarot, South Australia. 
Five months after the Christmas card was mailed to the mother of the murdered 14-year-old, the police chief commissioner in Melbourne got a strange anonymous letter regarding the case. It was postmarked May 1st, 1989, and it was typewritten. Just like the Christmas card, it was full of spelling and grammatical errors. It reads, Is the Tainong file gathering dust? Have you ran into a dead end? Need help? With a multitude of questions, but very few answers? Did you know you are dealing with mass murder in a scale never seen in this country? Only the top American serial killers surpass this cold-blooded killer. Did you know was another victim and others across three states? Did you find the brooch that Miller was wearing on the day of the murder? Or the pair of sterling silver blue earrings belonging to Catherine? What made this note so interesting to the police was that the missing jewelry was not public information and is probably something that only the killer would have known about. So the police believe that the author may be the actual killer. For that reason, the police tracked down the very typewriter that the letter was written on. It belonged to a convicted armed robber who was serving time in prison. However, they were able to confirm that he didn't write the letter and they are not sure who the author is. Since those letters, the killer has gone quiet. Over 2,000 people have been interviewed in connection with the six murders, but no one has ever been charged. Number 1. April Tinsley On April 1st, 1988, eight-year-old April Tinsley was playing with two friends in a quiet neighborhood in Fort Wayne, Indiana. At some point, they moved to a different house, but April forgot her umbrella. She left her friends to go retrieve it, and sadly, as she moved between houses, she was kidnapped. Her body was found three days later in a ditch in rural Amish country, not far from her home. Sadly, she had been raped and suffocated. Also dumped near the body was a sex toy in a Sears bag. Eyewitnesses said that they saw a man in the area where April was kidnapped. Based on their description, this sketch was developed and released to the public. At the time, he was driving a light blue pickup truck. Unfortunately, the sketch didn't turn up any suspects. Two years later, the police were called to a farm about 10 miles away from April's home. On the doors of a barn, someone had written a message in marker claiming responsibility for the murder of April Tinsley. The writer also said that he would kill again. At the time, the police were unsure if the killer actually wrote it or if it was just a sick prank. Luckily, the writer didn't follow through with his threat and he went quiet for the next 14 years. Then, out of the blue in April 2004, four notes written on yellow lined paper were found in Fort Wayne, Indiana. One of them was found in a mailbox, but the other three were found on the bikes of little girls. One note that was found in the basket of a five-year-old girl's bike was released to the media. The letter, which is a bit difficult to read, is believed to say, Hi honey, I've been watching you. I am the same person that kidnap and rape and kill April Tinsley. You are my next victim. If you don't report this to the police, or I don't see this in the paper tomorrow, or on the local news, or I will blow up your house. Included with the letters were disturbing souvenirs, which the writer called gifts. This included Polaroid pictures of the killer's body and a used condom. DNA was taken from the condom and tested against the DNA pulled from April's body, and they concluded that it was a match. However, the DNA didn't match any known offenders. In 2015, this composite sketch was developed based on the DNA. The FBI are currently looking for someone between the ages of 45 and 55 who looks like the man in this picture. They are also looking for help in identifying someone who was living in the Fort Wayne area that was still using a Polaroid camera in 2004 and owned a green bedspread like the one in this picture. This bedspread was in the background of the Polaroid picture that was left with one of the letters. The police hope that the mystery will be solved to give April's family some closure and to get a dangerous man off the streets. Thanks for watching this week's video. If you liked it, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe. We post a new video every Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you want to check out some other creepy mysteries, please check out one of our other videos on the screen now. And thanks again for watching.